bridge diver moving into position in turn. Strangely enough, sharks seem to fear the free diver's presence. Are they really shy? Or is this just feigned timidity, part of their regular hunting strategy? It's being vigilant every moment. You're paying attention, you're looking. They always want to come from the direction you're not looking. And the moment you stop paying attention, they figure it out and they come in. You know, for example, on a deep, competitive dive, I'm completely relaxed, and I don't care if I space out. Here, I'm always working to be relaxed, but I'm always paying 100% attention to everything. I'm always checking 360 degrees, and I'm always checking where Fred is relative to me, and he's doing the same thing. If great white sharks were as dangerous as the legends say, they would of course be impossible to dive with. But we've got to demystify these animals. Even if it's a great predator and a dangerous animal, it is possible to be in the water and dive with the white shark. Attaching the tag will be a decisive test. How will the great white react to the presence of divers bearing spear guns and to being hit by a dart? It's a world first before Fred no one had ever provoked this super predator like this without any protection. At some point, everyone will have some fear or apprehension. But what's important is to acknowledge this fear and to be honest with one's sensations. and the physical sensations. The awareness of one's body and the surrounding environment come together as one. In two weeks, with the help of his assistant, Fred has tagged eight great white sharks. It's a long-term project to get close to these predators and to gain their trust. So I think that if you do not know what is below you, that's, that's what scares you. But I think that it's changing. In the 70s, we just had that uh, idea of the stupid animal, the man-eater, the monster. But now we're getting a lot of things about them. And I think that they are not monsters, they are just doing their part in nature. We should get more information about them because we, we are just in time to, to avoid the extinction of the sharks.
Scientists estimate that there are only 3,500 great white sharks left in the ocean. This estimate may seem very low, but several studies have come to the same conclusion. They need to be protected, especially in the North American territorial waters. Fortunately, the tags placed by Fred Boyle have helped to resolve the mystery of the white shark's migrations. They gather in Guadalupe Island, but while males return each year, females only visit the island once every two years to mate. Then they stay at sea during the 18 months of their gestation. These studies have enabled the Mexican and American governments to define sanctuaries to protect these sharks that are as charismatic as they are threatened. The tags have revealed that as they get close to the coast of North America to give birth, females are highly exposed to industrial fisheries. The task is huge and the stakes are high. Every year, Fred is back to tag sharks either in Guadalupe or in another location. His reputation now precedes him, but he wants to go further, deeper. Back to where he started his first free dives, in the Azores. Beyond the green pastures, the volcanic islands of the Azores are mountains in the sea. These fertile lands arise from foundations several kilometers down below the surface and offer close to the coasts a unique window into the world of the deep. To achieve a childhood dream and to finally meet the ultimate free diver, the sperm whale. To me, the sperm whale is a super animal in more than one sense. As a free diver, of course, it's an inspiration. It's the ocean's greatest diver. It can dive down 3,000 meters and stay underwater for two hours at a time. Sperm whales live in all the oceans of the world, up to the age of 70. But to check the status of their populations, decimated by over three centuries of intensive whaling, Scientists are taking a species census. One of their methods is extremely original, collecting organic matter, giving information on the DNA specific to each animal, like the scraps of skin that these animals sometimes leave in their wake. These patches of skin have the same density as seawater and need to be fished out, a job tailor-made for Fred Boyle. So here we are trying to dive with the sperm whales in the Azores. But working with these animals is quite complicated. Ideally, we wait for them to stop and gather so that we can observe some of their more social behavior. Because if that's the case, we will be better accepted and can dive and work with them more easily. Nice. Good. Yes. So, 
so there were four, four individuals. Did you send the four? Uh, yes, we had we had three. It was one big male uh, standing still. And the one uh, I think the sample is from is a uh, smaller whale. Uh, maybe a juvenile male, male or maybe a female, but probably a juvenile. Since he is unsure, Fred will try to identify these animals before they plunge back into the abyss. Luckily, they gather right below the surface, a unique opportunity to photograph the whole group. It's a group of chattering sperm whales, communicating in a strange click language. They have families and pods. A very elaborate language. We even think that their language is more evolved than ours. They have outstanding cognitive skills. I have the feeling they communicate with us, but we're not yet capable of communicating with them. It's a pretty strong feeling. This animal is very gentle with divers. It is careful when it comes close. You can tell it is paying attention. It looks like it's trying to make you comfortable. This apparent paradox between the marine monster's power and what it is capable of communicating during an encounter is really disconcerting. use a language unknown to Fred. He replies with body language, which intrigues the youngest animals. Being so close, Fred can see the circular marks on the sperm whale's skin. Could this mean that here in the Azores, the sperm whales hunt giant squid? It's a question that has remained unanswered for many years. For me, the ultimate encounter would be with the giant squid. This animal is a living legend. Ever since my childhood, I've heard stories about these gigantic squids. We think they can measure up to 25 or 30 meters. It's both terrifying and fascinating. But I have a safe plan. So the idea is to go position ourselves in this area, where an upwelling current brings up all the nutritious particles. That creates a sort of underwater oasis, and that gives us a chance to see a giant squid. So listen, I'll dive and stay put around minus 50 meters with the lights and the camera. Just use the classic safety procedures. You wait for me when I come back up and check that the cable doesn't get tangled. dive quite deep, you can feel the nitrogen narcosis that divers also call the rapture of the deep. It's really a way to refocus on myself, to be aware of all of my body's sensations. Fred Boyle is the man facing the unknown.
one who conjures his own legends as he realizes that nothing in nature can be taken for granted. The only monsters that survive today are his own chimeras, our own chimeras. The ghosts of our imagination, ephemeral visions that bring us face to face with our ignorance. Paradoxically, this weakness may be our most precious gift. <laughs> 